Thanks. Okay. Uh, tēnā koto haremai, everyone. Um, my name is Luke Garn, and I'm a sociologist based at the Australian Red Cross Lifeblood. Uh, so Lifeblood is the national blood service in Australia. Um, now, many of you would probably be aware of how ethnicity plays a key role when someone's needing bone marrow, but it off also often plays quite a pivotal role in blood transfusion. So, um, and if we get time at the end, I can show you a little image to explain this a bit better. But usually if you need blood, you can, all of us have a blood type called AB or O, and you probably know which one it is. And usually if you need blood, you can get transfused one of, uh, one of those that matches. Um, however, if you have an illness and you require multiple transfusions, your body actually starts to really want its own blood. Um, and this means that you need to get a transfusion that's much closer to your own. And this happens occasionally. Um, usually it's not a problem if you're from the population of people who most of the blood donors are. But if you're from a, um, a minority population, that can cause problems. And even more, uh, we often have uh, rare blood types that are found in certain ethnicities and no one else. And then that can cause a problem. So a really great example close to home for um, in our region is that um, Polynesians and Filipinos are more likely to have a particular blood type. The fancy name is JK Null. Um, and no, and there's only not many other people in the world have found to have that particular blood type. And so in Australia, when we have shortages, we often have to have blood flowing in from New Zealand uh, to actually meet that demand. And this year with COVID, that's caused a lot of problems. So um, obviously, as you can imagine that in Western countries, this has become quite a problem of late when we've started to see more diverse populations, but that hasn't necessarily corresponded to diverse uh, blood donors. And so um, as you can imagine, that has cause shortages. Um, and so Lifeblood, like many other blood services around the world, have begun programs to find out what the barriers and facilitators to blood donation are for different ethnic minority communities. So uh, we were asked to focus on three ethnic regions, as you were describing before, and these were chosen due to the existence of rare blood types in those groups um, and the increasing demand for them in Australia. We also know that people with these ethnicities are less likely to donate in Australia or are less likely to continue to donate after they've made one donation. So we interviewed 43 people in qualitative interviews and these people either were um, previously donors, their current donors, um, or some of them were actually brand new donors and had donated once. Um, and we had a fairly good split between the three different regions as well. Just if you have any questions afterwards about recruitment, there's some interesting challenges we really face trying to recruit people to actually talk to us in this study. Um, and that was something that we're sort of looking at how that can actually go forward in our future research too, how we can overcome those challenges. So participants provided multiple reasons for why they donated blood and made little distinction between the motivations for their first donation and the motivation for their subsequent donations. And the decisions to donate were not the result of one clear motivation. Instead, they had complex interrelated motivations that combined to lead to that blood donation. Uh, most participants' initial response when asked around blood donation was that they donated out of a desire to help people um, in a way that's possible for them. So here's a quote, uh, I thought I could make a difference. That's why I wanted to donate, I suppose. It's a good thing to do, like there's people out there that really need it. And if I can help in that way, then it's a good cause. And while this desire to help others is frequently reported by blood donors, regardless of their background, um, participants in our study, it was often intrinsically like related to their cultural beliefs and values, um, in particular connected to religion. So the desire to help others frequently stemmed from religious beliefs and practices to donating to charity um, or helping out people in need. I practice Buddhism, we try our very best or whatever we can to help others. I can't say blood donation is a Buddhism practice, but it's a teaching there to try and help others when we can. So while the influence of religious values was reported by donors in each of those different regions, um, it was most often expressed by, uh, and across all different faiths, it was most often expressed by donors who actually followed Islam. Because of growing up in a Muslim family, we are told to give when people who need it don't have it. So the same rule applies if people don't have blood and you're able to provide that, then you should be able to give it. You should give it. 
Um, another big finding really was around medical knowledge. So many participants reported that they had donated blood because they were nurses or worked in healthcare or had medical professionals in their family or friendship circles. And they said that this made them aware then of the ongoing need for blood donation. Uh, by ongoing need, I mean regular blood donations. There is often a perception in communities, and we find this particularly in ethnic minority com communities, that you can donate once in your entire life and that's all people need. Uh, but lack, there's limited understanding that actually blood donation is something that we really want people to do ongoing. I think as working as a nurse, I saw the patients needed blood and that inspired me to donate. Um, and as I'll talk in a minute, this, having this medical knowledge really overcame, made people overcome a lot of the fears and hesitation around donating because they, this understanding, well, actually it's really needed, made people sort of overcome the fact that they were a little bit scared of doing this process. Seeing a lifeblood mobile donation unit driving around. So I think in New Zealand, you also have buses that go places with New Zealand blood that to get, um, do collections. And we still have that in Australia too. And the presence of this mobile donation centre in a public space, particularly at university campuses, was a salient and strong influence on people that encouraged them to make their first ever blood donation or their first, at least in Australia. The blood centre bus, I don't know what you, how you call it. They came to the university. That's how I started. Now the presence of the mobile donation unit um, within spaces that felt a, that the participants felt a part of was sufficient to overcome these barriers and fears again and mistrust or the lacking the confidence. Um, and it allowed ethnic minority donors to donate in a place that was safe and familiar to them, surrounded by the communities they knew. So the bus might go to um, a local um, shopping center that they attend. Uh, sometimes they attend their churches or mosques to uh, receive blood donation. Um, but in particular, universities were raised as a place where people felt comfortable, um, which is a good thing. Um, donating with others. So while participants were often motivated to donate by one or more of these reasons, many only began donating in Australia when these motivations were combined with the opportunity to donate in an organized group or with their friend. For some donating for the first time within a group or with someone else was about convenience, having transport organized, for example, or um, the donation appointment made for them and then being reminded by their group. Um, but really a lot of it came down to the fact that it provided them with this social safety net on their first visit, someone to talk to, someone else who knew the process. There was a group of us and we all went in to donate blood. One of the guys that came with us said he used to donate in the past, which kind of helped. Having that support from him was more beneficial than the information provided by our, the staff. So we really also, as you can imagine, wanted to really get down to the point of what these barriers were. Um, and sometimes they were the opposite of the facilitators, other times they're a little bit more complex. Um, convenience came up as one of the big issues. So most of the barriers that participants believe prevented them from uh, their communities from donating were issues of convenience, such as being time poor, having to make appointments and the location of donor centers. Now, while these issues impact blood donors, regardless of their ethnicity, our participants spoke of these issues as being specifically related to their ethnic community. So the requirement to make an appointment, for example, to donate at a specific time, date and place was not always compatible with people's cultural understandings of time or what they saw as their, uh, their community's propensity to work multiple jobs or jobs that don't necessarily follow standard rosters and uh, in business hours. So participants believed that this issues combined meant that it was really difficult for themselves or their community members to donate. So our culture is not like where you have to make an appointment and then you stick to that appointment. In Indonesia, it's not like that. They don't really appreciate time the way we appreciate time here. To make a commitment, it's a big ask. Whenever I go in, it's because I'm just stopping at the shopping center so I can just go in. And sometimes I'd be knocked back because you know you have to make or register or make an appointment. So I went away. There's other complications there. Um, you also have to prepare. For those of you who blood donate, you might know, but you have to prepare. You have to drink a certain amount of water before or have make sure you've eaten. Um, and so we found that people would often just turn up and say, yep, I'll donate. And they're like, well, have you drunk any water today or had breakfast? And they'd be like, no, not had breakfast yet. So then people would be sent away. Um, but then trying to find that middle ground is quite difficult. So to combat this barrier, participants suggested that lifeblood needed to extend opening hours and to create capacity to facilitate those who wish to just walk up and donate without appointments. 
And really participants from every ethnic group um, and, and, and ancestry regions um, cited various fears and confidence issues related to their culture. Uh, for example, donors from East or Southeast Asia believe that people from their communities often avoid blood donation due to a fear of hygiene and contamination. And that was unique to people from their background. My friend told me, are you sure that it's a fresh needle? What about if they've used it for other people? Um, they have this kind of thought that there's this risk of some sort of other illness. Um, one of the types of blood donation is called donating plasma. Um, I'm not sure how common it is in New Zealand. In Australia, it now makes up the most of our donations. And when you donate plasma at the end, you actually get, um, and during the process, you have stuff put back into your body, um, basically a saline solution. And people were concerned, well, who's that? Who does that belong to? Is that from someone else? Um, so there was this great fear around contamination. Um, Participants believe that many of their fears and their communities um, had towards blood donation could be allayed by having more lifeblood staff who shared their ethnicity. Uh, and while language was really a part of this, the desire for diversity of staff was also about having someone like themselves that they could relate to and feel more ease around. Um, and that kind of makes sense, you know, I, uh, this is a great quote. I guess it could be kind of helpful if there was actually Samoan employees who took the donations. Just knowing that there's a Samoan employee there kind of gives them that safeguard that someone's like me who can help me with the donation. Uh, and that came up from each of the different groups. Uh, lack of knowledge, uh, and this sort of goes back to that medical knowledge I talked about as a facilitator. So participants believe that many of the barriers from their communities stem from a lack of knowledge about blood donation. And in each of the groups, participants believe that members of their community needed more information about blood donation process, as well as the safety in order to relieve their anxiety. And ultimately, participants in each group believed that their communities were largely unaware of the need for blood donation and that more education was needed in their communities and information and education that they could relate to. Not many Polynesians that I know of actually donate. There is a huge lack of awareness about donating with my own, within my own culture. Growing up on the islands, it's not really the norm. There's just no awareness of it at all. They also suggested that this education material um, to be successful had to be less scientific, focus on potential benefits of donation for their own family and community, um, and include images and stories of people from their communities who donated or received blood products. If they see African people donating, they would probably be able to associate themselves to the same skin colour. Focus a lot on the family, don't talk science and all that sort of crap, they just switch off. I think that's a big lesson for all of us. Language barriers. Now, I didn't put this first because it's the obvious one. And funny enough, it didn't come up as the first thing that people talked about. It is when we talk to staff, but not when we talk to donors themselves. Um, and a majority of participants um, with either Sub-Saharan African or East Southeast Asian ancestries believe that language prevented many people in their communities from donating. Um, even though many in their communities were fluent in English, so came from countries where English uh, was either one of the languages or um, a large population speaks it as a second language. Participants from these groups believe that having more resources and information in people's first language or having staff that could speak it would really encourage people to donate. Having questionnaires in different languages, it will make a heap of a difference. I think that removes a barrier in terms of actually coming in. And I think having nurses that can speak the language may put people at ease as well. Another big one, and this goes back to um, religion. Now, if people are being motivated to donate for religion, um, we, you, you'd expect that there could be um, some issues there too around um, making sure that we facilitate those religious needs. And so this did come up. Um, and while every, um, but it, it came up in terms of some donors, but privacy for female donors also came up in terms of culture rather than just religion. Um, so, um, Melanesian and Polynesian donors often suggested that culturally women in their communities may prefer privacy from all donors, not just male donors, but from other women that they may not want to necessarily donate in a room, in a large room with everyone watching. Um, so we currently just have big rooms where everyone donates in front of everyone. Um, and people said, well, you know, some of the uh, elders in the community may not actually want to do that in front of everyone else or some young kid who's also donating. Um, but as you can imagine, uh, participants from Southeast Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa reported that for religious reasons, many Muslim women in their communities may prefer privacy from male 
donors and staff. And um, not that we have too many male nurses in the organisation, but that was often an issue too. People were hesitant about coming in if they weren't able to pick their um, nurse. So the findings of this uh, study um, demonstrate the multifaceted and interrelated nature of facilitators and barriers that impact donation by people from ethnic minority groups in Australia. And while many of the barriers and facilitators are similar to those of non-ethnic minority donors, when they were discussed by the donors in our study, they were frequently enmeshed with and shaped by their culture, ethnicity and minority status. And so to address these challenges, we suggest that Lifeblood work closer with individual ethnic minorities um, to better understand their needs and to then co-design uh, resources and strategies that will facilitate greater recruitment and retention of blood donors from the specific communities. Um, and if you're interested, I can tell you about some of the projects that we are now doing uh, in that space. Uh, so thank you. Um, if I have time, Avril, I just want to show one little slide that explains the whole blood thing. Um, Go for it. You've been very... Okay. Oh. So I love this. And if you want, I can share these slides. At the bottom, there's actually a link to a whole article about this. Um, uh, for those who don't know, donuts are a big thing in Australia, to, in Victoria at least today, because we had zero cases for two days in a row and everyone talked about it being donut day. Um, but anyway, um, the... Uh, the donut analogy here sort of shows the different blood types, the ones that you're familiar with, the A, B and O. And so, you know, you can see that those with A positive have the sprinkles on it. The B positive are strawberry, but they have sprinkles. Um, and you go all the way to the O negative people and they have absolutely no toppings on them at all. And that's why they can go to A, B and A, um, a and B, right? So because they're not um, got all these toppings. So that's why O negative is one that all of us can have, which is fantastic. Um, now this is this is what usually is what's needed. You need to match these toppings or the lack of toppings. Um, but really, this is actually what our blood types really look at when you get closer to them. They look more like this donut. <laughs> and all those little things from the M&Ms to the toppings and the drizzle, they're um, antigens and other things that actually are in our blood. And so when someone starts to need lots of blood over a period of time, um, and one of the groups of people um, have a, a condition called sickle cell anemia, which some of you might know of, it largely impacts people who have sub-Saharan African ancestry. Um, and people who suffer from sickle cell anemia often need lots of transfusions throughout their life. And that's when their body starts to go, hang on, I need blood that has exactly the same toppings as this one. And that's where we start to find difficulties, particularly with people um, um, who have these rarer blood types, so rarer combinations of toppings on their donut. Um, so I like to use that one for uh, the non-biological -science, uh, non science audiences because it kind of helps to explain. And that's what I was given when I first started working at Lifeblood too, to understand this better. Kia ora, Luke. That was brilliant. I did not, that was a very, the most impressive way of learning a whole lot about blood types <laughs> and, and the two tiny little images, you know, that's very good. Yep. I was hoping you'd invented it, but somebody else had already invented no, it. No, no. <laughs> uh, uh, Dr. Alison Gould at, at Lifeblood came up with that one. So Genius. Yep. I hope it's sharing around the world, you know, <laughs> given the ubiquity of donuts. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's fantastic. Okay, so we have time. Good time, 10 to 15 minutes max for questions and discussion of Luke's presentation. Luke, you could stop sharing your yep. screen now, if that's okay. Um, so now, um, who would like to ask a question or make a comment? Ruth. Thank you. Uh, thanks Luke, that was really interesting. It's, I'm not sure if it's a question yet, but as I was listening to you, I, I thought I could I could hear a resonance with some stuff that um, I've been interested in, and that's about body donation. Being involved in some stuff that looks at why people donate their bodies and why other people don't. Um, and one of the things that comes across is like sickness and science, and advances in science. That's why people might want to donate uh, donate their bodies. Um, when it comes to what you're talking about, particularly that last point about the sickle cell anemia, that if that's a really well-known condition from people, was it from sub-Saharan Africa, you said? That's right, yeah. So like, what, did you talk to people, and 
what did people who are from sub-Saharan Africa, did they have anything to say about that? I mean, if, it, if it's something that they'd have to be aware of, if, you know, if you're having to have multiple transfusions through your life, it would be, you'd expect that at least to be a blip around. Yeah. You know, want, you know, well, I need to donate because I'm going to need it soon. <laughs> Maybe I, don't, I just, I think there's a question in there. I'm not really sure, but. Yep. Yeah. Um, well, no, uh, actually, there's a couple of things you've probably touched on there too. So there's a broader area of research where we sort of call it SOHO, which sounds funny. It's <laughs> substances of human origin. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it covers a range of things that people donate, as you can all imagine. Um, and yeah. there's a lot of things um, in culture and ethnicity where some things might be acceptable some mm -hmm. things won't even in terms of religion and blood donation or being able to receive a transfusion some religions have very strict criteria around what can and can't and it's quite interesting because um, some people aren't aware that vaccinations for example including potential covid vaccinations are actually made out of blood donations or plasma donations um, and while some religious groups won't take uh, blood transfusions they will take the uh, vaccination that's made out of the blood transfusion um, so there's real intricate things there um, when it comes to body donation as you said or even organ donation again real differences um, and there's been some great work actually in New Zealand on Maori organ donation uh, which is fantastic and I believe that's from people from SANS as well so um, there's uh, there's definitely a lot of work in that broader SOHO space mm. regarding sickle cell uh, people from sub-Saharan African backgrounds definitely were aware of sickle cell anemia and they talked about it. Um, people who have sickle cell can't donate blood. Um, oh, okay. But people who have similar um, blood types often are required to donate blood. Now, in, in um, sub-Saharan Africa, uh, if people are migrants from those regions, we have a lot of refugees from those areas, um, they often don't have a tradition of donating blood in their countries. Um, if they do, it's usually for someone. So they get called up to donate for their sibling or their family, um, or they donate for credits. So you donate so that when it comes to you needing a transfusion, you're higher up on the list for blood. And we take it for granted in the West that there's always blood sitting in the hospital for us. That's not always the case. Um, the other complication there, which reduces the number of people donating whole blood as opposed to plasma, is that people from sub-Saharan African regions often carry malarial antibodies. Um, and you can't donate whole blood if you've had contact with malaria. And it's whole blood we need here, not plasma, when it comes to these rare blood types, just to mm -hmm. add to the complication. Interestingly, with the science hat on there too, is that um, sickle cell anemia as an illness has as, as an evolution in people's blood type due to uh, long periods of time, like thousands of years contact with malaria. Um, and that's why certain ethnic groups have these rare blood types. It's because of often contact with certain illnesses or certain um, viruses gives changes the way your blood develops through generations. And so you pick this up from your ancestors and little things like viruses will trigger these mutations over time. Um, yeah. So I hope that answered a couple of your questions. Uh, America is another great place, the United States, sorry, um, where you actually, people know about sickle cell because um, African-Americans and African-Caribbeans uh, often carry sickle cell anemia genes. And um, so the awareness around blood donation in African-American communities is quite high because of that as well. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, great. We're getting an education, which is really, <laughs> An extra bonus. Um, is there, we have time for one more question, I think, if somebody has got a question to ask. Tina. Can you speak up? I think you're maybe yeah. a long way. Nah, that's it. Uh, yes. um, yeah, you spoke about recruitment difficulties, and this is, I'm always interested in recruitment issues. Mm. Could you just um, outline some of the, the difficulties that you had in terms of recruitment? Yeah, so it's actually, there's several things that are quite funny. And in the project I'm doing now, we're facing similar issues. But um, the first one was that in Lifeblood, uh, uh, and I've successfully got, so starting in December, we'll be collecting ethnicity 
on our, when people go in to donate blood. Right now we don't, we only ask country of birth, which is a bit tricky. Um, and the reason why we're switching to ethnicity is because a lot of people are born in Australia with different ethnic backgrounds, um, but so they're not actually picked up. But also, and this is where the recruitment one was funny, we got a list of all the people who were born in sub-Saharan Africa and we started calling them. And very quickly we realized, uh, and our research assistant Cecilia was from Kenya, we very quickly realized that um, a large number of them were um, white African or people from with European ancestry, um, which was something we had kind of suspected. Um, even when we started calling people from uh, who were born in Samoa, we started finding people had German ancestry as opposed to Polynesian. Um, so there was all these added, and of course, we actually just didn't bother calling people from New Zealand because we knew that if the New Zealanders are the second biggest group who donate in Australia, other than Australian born. Um, but again, trying to find people within that huge list of thousands of people who might be Maori was not going to um, help. So we had those difficulties. Then we had difficulties when we started making um, scheduling time to do the interview with people that um, there was those cultural issues around making appointments actually began to show in the recruitment that people, you'd ring people at that time and they'd say, oh yeah, um, you said 2.30, but I thought you might call it, you know, you know, quarter to three. Um, and so, and then people calling us back and it, it was quite hit and miss. So we quickly worked out that was actually a finding too around the timing and, and making appointments. Um, right now we're doing a co-design um, project with Polynesian communities to sort of expand on this now to actually design those solutions. Um, and they're very, because it's co-design, the, the special stakeholder group that we formed to start with, which we've just had our first meeting, they're very keen to just do the recruitment themselves, which I'm really happy with because they've said, you know, Luke, if you go out there and try and recruit, people might say yes, but they're not gonna show up or um, what, you know, for multiple reasons why if I presented myself, they probably won't wanna do the study. So our, um, the members of the community are going to go out and recruit for us. Um, which is already showing us a bit of a sign that to get blood donors, you'll need to get people from within the community to act like gatekeepers and bring people along to donate blood. Yeah. It's fascinating. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> That's and now, of course, with COVID, we, we're uh, like, I haven't been in the office since February. So all our research has gone online and um, you get the added bonus of technological issues trying to do focus groups on oh, yeah. co-design workshops online, which is great fun. Oh, cool, blimey. That's all I can say <laughs> about that. It's really amazing to hear about, you know, the role of a sociologist within an organisation like Lifeblood Australia. It's, you know, I never thought about sociologists being involved in blood donation services. So now that'd be another whole presentation you could do if you come over here for a conference is tell us all about the career of a sociologist and your your field it's fascinating yeah. 